Hi everyone, uh, welcome to NCVO's Working with a New Government uh, webinar. Um, I'm Rosie, I'm in our communications team. I'm here with Chris Walker, who is our Public Affairs Manager, and uh, Ben Westerman, who is our Policy Manager and Resident Brexit Expert. Um, so just a quick overview, we're going to do a 30 minute presentation with uh, Chris and Ben doing their kind of respective areas. We're going to move on to a 15 minute Q&A after that. So if you can type your questions in throughout the webinar, just, you know, whenever you have a thought, send a question in. Um, and then I will pick some of the questions uh, at the end, usually ones that the same kind of things coming up the most. Um, and then uh, at the end of the webinar, uh, please just take a couple of minutes to complete the uh, follow-up survey so we know the kind of content you guys want going forward. And um, I'm just going to pass you over to Chris Walker. Okay, thank you, Rosie. Um, so I thought we should start by uh, saying what we're going to uh, be looking at this afternoon. So um, we've kind of got four principles uh, of working with the government that we're going to um, share this afternoon. Um, uh, we also want to kind of think about the opportunities there might be to engage with uh, new ministers, uh, ex-ministers and, and other prominent backbenchers. Um, we'll also be thinking about, uh, inevitably, uh, the challenges and opportunities of uh, influencing while everything uh, appears to be kind of dominated by uh, Brexit. Uh, and we'll also talk a little bit about some of the pros and cons of, of governmental change um, for charities. And actually, in fact, that's where I'm going to start. So uh, in terms of what governmental change means for charities, um, so uh, there are some, uh, I think, positive things. Um, so there's uh, certainly new opportunities to kind of engage with, with new people and build relationships. So perhaps uh, people who haven't, uh, are coming fresh into government with kind of enthusiasm, new ideas, uh, uh, opportunities to kind of work uh, with them uh, but also you might have found that uh, there were particular sort of policy issues where you had uh, blockages in government and so it might be kind of an opportunity to uh, revisit some of those things if you've got someone uh, who takes a different view and, and uh, is going to approach issues in a slightly different way um, but of course there are um, challenges around around this as well so you may well have built up kind of good relationships with uh, particular ministers uh, you may have yeah, particular uh, political capital that um, is now kind of lost um, and uh, also the kind of expertise that people might have uh, built up over time um, you might find yourself having to kind of go back to the very start when you're kind of talking to new ministers uh, really kind of going over um, the basics again so uh, it is unfortunately something that we uh, sometimes have to do um, so I'm going to uh, go through all of these principles in a bit more detail um, shortly uh, but just to kind of give you an overview view of, of what we're talking about so uh, generally speaking I think um, it's better to make sure that uh, what you're doing is kind of well thought through rather than just making sure you kind of um, uh, contact the new government as quickly as possible um, but you actually have something to say and you kind of know what it is um, really important I think to kind of focus on what your expertise is as a, as a charity and also how you can kind of fit that within uh, the new agenda as that starts to emerge um, thirdly, having clear specific actions that new ministers can take, uh, rather than kind of just being these sort of general introductions, uh, having something that um, they can already start kind of working on and, and sort of see where you're coming from. Um, and then also make sure that, you know, you've got to remember that uh, where we're really able to kind of add value is, um, is the, the people we work with, you know, our beneficiaries. So making sure you're uh, building links between government uh, and the people who you're um, working with. Um, so kind of on that first point, uh, this idea that well thought through best than immediate. Um, so I'm sure many of you will have already done your uh, your kind of welcome letters and, and that's absolutely fine. Um, I think the kind of key point is don't worry too much if it's um, if it's kind of not uh, on the you know afternoon that they've they've been appointed. Really important to kind of think carefully about what it is you want to say because you are very much setting a tone with your your sort of first contact. So um, if anyone hasn't, they don't be too uh, concerned by that. Actually, make sure you kind of really thinking about what it is um, that you uh, want and kind of what your vision is that a new minister might be. Um, able to help you with. Um, the other thing I think I would say as well is, it, of course, it's not all about ministers. And then, and in particular, we've got we had a really big um, turnover 
uh, in, in terms of new government. So you've actually now got a lot of ex-ministers sitting on the back benches. Now, some of them might want to take their time out. They might well want to go to the cricket, do things like that. Um, but also they will, as, as time goes on, they'll be looking for new things to work on. Um, it's often true that sort of former ministers will uh, then like, pick up a particular interest in the area they've been working on. Um, so there could be opportunities um, for you to work with that. Also, they, perhaps people you've had a relationship with in the past who you sort of had to let it slip a bit because they've become ministers. So really kind of think about all of the people you might be. Uh, potentially working with uh, in the new environment. Um, second principle is, um, as I said, about focusing on, on what it is that you do. So really important to remember that's kind of your where you're able to kind of add value to government decisions is in uh, thinking about kind of what it is that you actually can bring to the table, what it is you have expertise in, um, and then making sure uh, one, that you can demonstrate that expertise to government and they can see you as someone who is worth uh, talking to, but also thinking about um, how uh, how you can fit that expertise with the new government agenda, uh, what sort of things um, does your work kind of really tie in with and, and where can you um, in particular uh, sort of add something. Um, so we've had a bit of a think about what we know so far about um, the agenda of the Boris Johnson uh, government. Um, I think we'll learn a lot more over the coming um, days and weeks, but um, this is kind of our initial uh, thinking. Um, so obviously, I, I think the most uh, obvious thing is uh, Brexit is, is going to continue uh, to dominate things. So uh, there was a story um, uh, the other day about uh, Dominic Cummings, new uh, special advisor number 10, uh, telling other special advisors that um, their goal is uh, Brexit by the 31st of October, uh, by any means necessary. So um, there really is going to be a lot of focus on making that happen. Uh, no deal preparation is going to be stepped up. Um, and it might be that it's quite kind of difficult to really look beyond that um, for the next few months, potentially longer uh, in an no deal scenario. Um, I think we're also likely um, to see uh, more money being spent, uh, particularly I'd look at areas like infrastructure. Uh, where, um, for example, uh, the Chancellor Sajid Javid has also kind of in the past made the case that we should be spending a lot more on uh, infrastructure uh, and some public services. So um, I will caveat that slightly in that, um, firstly, I don't think um, it, this is not about kind of reversing all the cuts that have taken place over the last uh, 10 years. Um, and I also think we're looking primarily at your kind of uh, your kind of eye-catching announcements really. So, for example, the things we've seen early on, the kind of 20,000 uh, more police, uh, extra spending on education. So there is, I think, an opportunity uh, for charities there, um, but it's about thinking about what is, uh, the, if, you, if you are arguing for more funding in a particular area, uh, making sure that you've kind of got a good story and it's something that the government will think is likely to sort of, uh, connect with the public. And the other thing as well to be aware of, of course, is I think here is where uh, the lack of a government majority will really start to um, uh, bite potentially. And you've got uh, a lot of Tory MPs who are suddenly a bit bit happier about uh, or a bit more comfortable uh, voting against the government. Um, they will be experiencing potential problems in their local area and that might be something that they do start to um, feel more confident. So I, I think as I wrote in my blog about this um, last week, I think there are potentially some more opportunities um, opening up when it comes to influencing around uh, funding. So I think it's important that we kind of don't miss those opportunities if they are there. Um, another thing we've kind of seen uh, in terms of the visits um, that uh, the new Prime Minister has made um, is this kind of uh, focus on areas, uh, particularly outside London, but in particular, I think uh, we'll be looking at the North. So uh, his first visit was uh, to Manchester to talk about uh, rail links. Um, so I think we'll see, uh, it never entirely went away, but a bit of a kind of resumption of the agenda around uh, Northern Powerhouse. Uh, so I think we'll be hearing uh, a lot more about that again. Uh, and then the other thing with Brexit, and I think certain concerns about what it might mean for the union, um, we saw visits uh, to Scotland and Wales in the first week. And I think, again, that will be something um, that uh, he comes back to uh, again. Um, and then the other, the other kind of thing, he actually set out uh, um, relatively ambitious, certainly uh, uh, talked about some pretty ambitious proposals, uh, in particular, some things like social care. 
uh, uh, when he made the speech outside number 10. Um, so I think there, there will be a session, that's where the kind of focus is going to be. Um, but uh, I would say probably don't expect too much movement on that until Brexit is done. Obviously, uh, at what point Brexit is done is in itself quite a, a difficult question to answer. So um, it's difficult to know kind of where down the line some of these things will start to happen. But at the very least, I wouldn't expect any kind of quick movement, even though he has talked about um, some of those issues. Um, so we are going to ask a few kind of poll questions as we go. Um, so the first one is around um, whether you have kind of identified um, any specific opportunities in the government's agenda. So you should now hopefully have some options in front of you. Um, so hopefully you'll have been looking at kind of what they've been saying in your area. So uh, and if you have and have identified things, then uh, we've got yes. Uh, but then we've also got a few things. If you haven't, a few reasons why. So perhaps you've um, uh, you want to do it, but you kind of you don't really feel you've got a, a good grip on what the government are doing yet. Uh, maybe you think there aren't actually. You've looked at it. You think there aren't any opportunities for you to uh, really kind of influence. Um, or perhaps you're kind of looking and thinking, well, government is the central government is difficult at the moment, um, so maybe you're better off kind of uh, looking elsewhere, uh, maybe thinking about local government, uh, maybe thinking about other kind of organisations outside government, maybe thinking about things like you know, how you can uh, influence business. Um, so we should hopefully get those results too. Um, okay, well, that's uh, reasonably good, I think, uh, in that uh, nearly half of you have managed to at least uh, find some opportunities. Uh, to move forward and um and many others of you i think are probably waiting and i think that makes sense to me because i don't think we have a certainly don't have a clear sense of what every department's going to do so um uh, so good that there's not too many of you who really feel kind of like totally uh, kind of locked out of things so um uh yes yeah. so the next uh, principle to talk about is around having kind of clear specific actions that new ministers can take so um when you're kind of getting in touch for the first time, you probably won't be able to talk about everything. So part of it will be a bit about um, scene setting. But I think it is useful to kind of give them something that they can uh, get started with, um, even if it's uh, you know kind of relatively, um, uh, relatively kind of a, a straightforward, simple kind of ask really. But I think when you're coming in as a new minister, and uh, it can be really helpful if you've got that sense of what are the things I can really start working on. Um, straight away and I think the organisations that are able to sort of really clearly articulate what it is they want uh, from government will um, be more successful so very important to kind of be um, clear and specific about uh, what it is that you want. Um, and then the other kind of uh, principle I wanted to talk about was um, I think it's really important to remember this is kind of where our, our value really lies uh, is with our beneficiaries, um, uh, the people we um, support, uh, the people we work with um, so I think it's really important to be able to demonstrate that uh, first uh, first thing we do actually kind of speak on behalf um, of those beneficiaries, um, but also that we can kind of provide links between uh, government uh, and those uh, people. Uh, so for us, uh, our beneficiaries are, are charities as a, as, a, as a membership body for charities. Um, so we're all going to be looking um, to demonstrate that we actually do kind of reflect uh, what charities are thinking and, and that we have that kind of expertise that we can uh provide to government but also that when they need to speak to kind of a lot of a uh, lot of charities that we're able to kind of make those links we're able to kind of get people in the room um so think about how you might be able to do that uh with with new ministers kind of working in your area i think would be a good idea um also we're thinking about uh some of the people working behind the scenes um so uh special advisors uh, lists starting to come together now um couple of people i think are worth mentioning in number 10 uh, so you'll probably all have read um, about uh, Dominic Cummings uh, coming in um, as a special advisor. I think a pretty kind of clear sense from that that um, this is a government that's very much in campaign mode, whether this is uh, campaigning around getting Brexit done or potentially uh, if there is an election called uh, about winning an election. So I think that's already sent a pretty kind of clear message of the way um, that this government is going to uh, operate on that. Uh, the other one I think it's worth flagging um, for charities is that uh, Danny Kruger uh, has been uh, appointed as uh, political secretary uh, in number 10. So uh, Danny Kruger, for those of you who don't know, um, he founded uh, the charity Only Connect um, and he's also spent the last uh, year or so 
uh, possibly a bit more uh, working out of um, DCMS on the civil society strategy. So I think uh, we certainly see him as a potentially kind of a useful ally uh, in number 10, at the very least someone who does understand uh, the importance of charities and kind of what they can bring um, to government. Um, it's also worth thinking about your relationships with senior civil servants. So um, obviously those people will largely be kind of remaining in place uh, from previously but if you do want to kind of refresh that relationship uh, then that can be a good opportunity and uh, kind of uh, perhaps if you don't have um, a relationship with permanent secretary or other, other civil servants um, maybe now is a good time to kind of start thinking about how you uh, build that up and remember as well that officials are they provide that kind of stability and certainty uh, to some extent, uh, those that aren't being pulled off for no deal preparation for those time. Um, but they're also a really important source of intelligence. So um, the, really the best way to find that out uh, about what um, changes might have happened with new ministers, what the priorities might be and, and how things are going to um, change. So do you kind of um, keep those discussions happening? Um, they'll probably still be a bit unclear at the moment, but as we go forward, um, they will be the best kind of source of information about what um, departments are, are doing, um, so do remember those. Um, so I just want to talk briefly about um, the prospects in the direction, because I think it is, it's certainly possible. Um, and I think not just the appointment of Dominic Cummings, but also uh, the way that the cabinet has been formulated into um, something which feels like it's fairly united around being able to accept no deal so even the people who previously we thought were uh, skeptics of, of no deal um, or opponents of no deal have kind of had to sign up to the idea that they're prepared to kind of accept it so i think the idea is about building quite a unified um cabinet in government uh, as we potentially look towards an election so um, probably the key thing to look at is what the polls are doing i think because I think if Boris Johnson does see that there's an opportunity uh, to win a bigger majority, so um, not least because uh, there are, as we've seen, there are things that can go uh, wrong and make it more difficult for you. So uh, 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 today, for example, there is a by-election happening. So tomorrow, it's it's not certainly not impossible that the um, government's majority could be uh, reduced further. So if there is an opportunity, and it looks like a, a clear opportunity to improve the position of Parliament. Uh, and get a mandate for doing things like uh, no deal, then I think that opportunity, opportunity may be taken. So I think it's at the very least worth starting to think about what an election would look like for you, what your main ask would be, are you going to do a manifesto, things like that. And it may even be an opportunity to really start planning what you would do. So uh, not you know, booking things, but you know, just thinking about if there was an election in the autumn, how would you go about it? Um, so we've actually got another uh, poll question on this one. Um, so the question we're asking is, uh, how prepared are you for an election? Um, so we've kind of got it fully prepared. Now, I'm not sure it's probably even a good idea to be fully prepared at this stage because, you know, um, all sorts of things could happen. Um, but um, I guess most people are probably uh, going to be somewhere in the middle there. I think I'd probably put us that have done some preparation at the moment in that we've, we've started to think about it, but we haven't necessarily put sort of um, firm plans in place. So, Kind of interesting to see. Um, I have heard of a few people have even kind of started getting into kind of manifesto writing. So um, it's possible that some of you are, are a bit further um, down the road. Um, so we should have those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, I think that's kind of what I'd expect. So um, majority of you have done some sort of uh, preparation, um, but obviously um, I, I, I understand why people won't have really kind of thought about it. But I, I, I think it is worth. And particularly over the summer, worth just starting to think about how you might approach it and, and how you might be able to do things. Um, so uh, the other thing that I think is worth talking about in terms of the uh, parliamentary agenda coming up uh, is this idea of uh, that uh, an election would happen not because um, uh, the Prime Minister decides it's a good time for an election and, and a potential opportunity, but if um, the uh, if, uh, Commons uh, votes no confidence um, in the government. Um, so the numbers on this are pretty tight and there is a kind of suggestion that there are enough Conservative MPs who would be prepared uh, to vote uh, no confidence if it meant stopping no deal. Now one of the problems, there are a couple of quite big problems with this. Um, 
so I'm slightly skeptical about it happening. So one is that, I mean, it really is a very big decision for a, for a Conservative MP. Uh, you know you're probably going into, it means you're going to be causing an election, and it will be an election at which uh, you will not be the Conservative candidate uh, in your um, constituency. So it's a, it's a kind of a potentially career, well, realistically a career-ending move, uh, which um, people are going to be quite reluctant to do. Uh, and then the other thing is the question about can you actually even at this stage stop no deal um, by uh, having a, a vote in the Congress of election? Uh, we've basically passed the point where you can definitely have an election um, before uh, the 31st of October, so the government has enough leeway that they could prevent it until afterwards. And there is a kind of question about, well, would the government actually want uh, no deal to happen in the middle of an election campaign? But, you know, uh, we can't be entirely sure, given that much of the promises the government are about, we are definitely leaving on 31st of October. They might find it quite difficult um, to even kind of ask for an extension in, in those circumstances. So. Um, I think it's kind of worth uh, bearing that in mind. Um, so we'll kind of see how this plays out, but it may be the kind of the moment has passed and have to do other. Now the other thing you could do, uh, which again I think is pretty tricky, is you could uh, you would have to be prepared to not only vote no confidence, but uh, to vote for a kind of temporary prime minister to ask uh, for um, uh, an extension before you uh, started your election campaign and realistically that prime minister would have to be Jeremy Corbyn so again that's another difficult thing for uh, someone who's currently a Conservative MP to do so I think it could be slightly tricky. Um, so Ben is now going to talk to us a bit about uh, what this all means for Brexit so I'll hand over to Ben. Thanks Chris. Um, so Brexit has had a um, stifling effect on, on the ability of charities and, and people, in fact, across sectors um, to influence government at all. Um, uh, even sectors as, as kind of linked into government as the banks have really, really struggled with influencing. Um, over the course of Theresa May's ministry, we saw the, the government departments become a lot more siloed, become a lot, um, there's a kind of big breakdown of communication amongst them, lack of trust amongst them. Um, and in the context of competing for, for funding, that's obviously quite quite bad news. And so it made uh, getting policy change onto agenda very, very difficult. Uh, and of course, combined with that is, is Parliament, which is obviously obsessed with Brexit necessarily so, because it's such, such a complex issue. Um, and so the, the result is that there has been very little space to talk about policy that, that isn't related to Brexit. Um, and if you think through the achievements of, of Theresa May's government, you'd struggle to find too many um, pieces of legislation which were put through which weren't um, as a result of all related to Brexit. Um, and that's just the nature of how complex Brexit is. Um, equally, we've got we've got three part of the three kind of big parties, not, not including the Brexit party at the moment because it, its name suggests what it's about, but the three other the three other main parties all currently defined by voters on their stance on Brexit with the Conservative Party in no deal, the Labour Party in no ambiguity, the Lib Dems in their very specifically pro-Remain stance. Um, and so it's it's there's, there's very little um, space for social change issues, which obviously charities will be looking to get onto the agenda as much as possible. Even an election probably doesn't change that much because whoever wins an election it doesn't look like there'll be a huge majority. And then even even if there was, this this will continue to take up parliamentary time. Even if we get whether we whether we get a deal or we don't get a deal, um, Brexit's likely to dominate political discussion for a good good while yet, um, because. If we get no deal, there'll of course be the fallout from that. And if we get a deal, then we enter into long protracted negotiations over the future relationship with the EU and um, a free trade agreement with the EU, which will take huge amounts of, of political capital and time. Um, so I think it's very important that, that in terms of influencing, we're looking beyond Brexit now um, and looking at what the new administration is, is looking for after Brexit. As Chris has said, Boris Johnson has, has promised a very wide ranging a quite ambitious um, domestic agenda and any new administration will currently be looking for a, for a good news story um, particularly if they're re-elected at general election and have a fresh fresh mandate to kind of make changes in the country as, as people want um, and so it's really important for charities to be identifying areas within those within that agenda that they can feed into that they they feel are important to their work and um, using the relationships they have or can build to get those issues onto the agenda when politicians will be looking for um, good news stories, as I say, things to talk about that aren't Brexit, that, that will kind of sell them well to the electorate. Um, it's also really good 
um, opportunity to, as Chris said, revisit policy decisions which are in the, in the process of being made or have not yet been made. People will have new ideas and want to bring them to government. Um, and it's a really good opportunity for, for charities to, to um, feed into that. So the Shared Prosperity Fund is a really good example of something that was pledged by Theresa May's government. Boris Johnson has, has reaffirmed a commitment to it. So it's an opportunity for, for charities to talk to government and, and talk about what issues there have been so far, how they wanted to look, what, how much money there, th there should be in it, and so on and so forth. Um, however, as I said, Brexit has had this stifling effect, and that's not going to stop for the next few months. Um, no deal preparations are going to consume government, at least until 31st October. Um, we've seen uh, responsibility for no deal preparations given to Michael Gove. Um, he is chairing a cabinet meeting every day, so the reports go um, to talk about what preparations are being done. We've seen the Chancellor commit £2 billion now to, to no deal spending. Um, and it's a really important message that, that government only really has capacity to plan for itself. Um, there's an element to which charities are on their own and have to be doing their own no deal preparations now. Um, to that end, NCVO um, will be in the next week or two releasing some guidance for charities on practical steps that can be taken to mitigate um, against some of the potential disruption we could see in a no-deal scenario. Um, but that will be government's focus at least until 31st of October. As Chris says, that may that we may see an election during that time, of course, um, but, but it doesn't really have capacity to do much more than no-deal plan. Um, and you often find that relationships with officials in the civil service are disrupted because they get taken off their normal jobs uh, onto no deal prep, um, which is very much going to be the focus of, of the entire civil service, um, particularly under, under Dominic Cummings, who, who has a quite strained relationship with civil service um, historically. Um, so what, what influencing can be done then um, is, the, is the golden question. There are a few routes to go down. Of course, as Chris said, civil servants are, officials are a really good place to start. Um, they do have consistency regardless of political goings on. Um, where you have good relationships, it's really important to keep those up. Looking to places like the Office of, Office of Civil Society, who ha have a really good way of engaging with the sector and understand the sector's issues. Um, umbrella organisations um, such as us, of course. Um, it's really important that we work together. Now, the government has a, has a way of viewing civil society as one single entity, when of course it's a very, very broad, diverse thing. Um, but if, if it's going to continue viewing us as one thing, it's quite important, I think, for, for us to be talking to each other, working out the issues that, that are common to all organisations and speaking to government through umbrella bodies or through the larger organisations um, so that policy change can, can be kind of affected for, for the benefit of everyone in the sector. Um, another route is via select committees. Now, select committees are very interesting now because um, with the parties so divided within themselves, Select committees provide a very rare opportunity for some cross-party work. They're obviously all um, staffed by MPs across the parties, and we're seeing more and more select committees pop up um, to talk about issues that are affected by Brexit, even if they're not solely on Brexit. So, of course, there is the Brexit Select Committee chaired by Hilary Benn, but there are other committees that are being chaired. There's, of course, the Charities um, one, but there's, there's um, uh, one being chaired by Stephen Kinnock on post-Brexit funding, which is looking at ways in which um, charities can engage with government and engage with government funding and how that can be approved after Brexit, regardless of the outcome. Um, there's also a really good opportunity around, around backbench MPs, as Chris mentioned earlier. We have, we have at the moment an extraordinarily experienced backbench um, on, on both sides of the House. We have, on the Tory side, we have people like a former Prime Minister, Chancellor, Foreign Secretary, so on and so forth, um, who are out of ministerial jobs now. Um, just on the Labour side, we've got people like Hilary Benn, we've got Yvette Cooper, Margaret Becker, who are extraordinarily experienced operators who, in, in what you'd call, I guess, normal times, would probably have ministerial jobs or shadow ministerial jobs, but because of the various political goings on, don't. And so there's a really good opportunity to speak to them and they can use their, not only their influence in Parliament, but their influence in the media to talk about issues that, that are important and indeed they'll want to talk about issues that aren't Brexit because it's very important to MPs at the moment that they demonstrate that there is more going on than just Brexit um, in, in politics. Um, but the other thing that's worth mentioning is, is looking outside of central government um, when it comes to influencing, talking to local government, talking, uh, looking at your partnerships across sectors, looking at cross-cutting campaigns which have influence ac across lots of sectors, you know, speaking to organisations, you know, 
for instance, the larger ones like the CBI, but there's a there's a lot of issues where we can look at our partnerships with other, other sectors because the Brexit, and particularly no deal Brexit, will affect all of us regardless of the space in which we work. Um, so I think the real message from all of this is, is that influencing Brexit itself is, is probably not going to happen, um, but it's far more important that we start thinking about planning for a no deal scenario and um, how we can work together to influence the agenda after Brexit so that that's positive for charities. Okay, uh, thanks, thanks, Ben. So that kind of brings us to one last um, question we have for you before we get on to Q and A. So we we kind of touched on this a bit, um, and I think our general message is we think that uh, Brexit has made it more difficult to influence government on kind of other things. There, there's been that kind of lack of space and time, but we kind of do want to sense check that a bit. So we've got um, various options there from uh, how Brexit has impacted your ability to influence government. So uh, from significantly improved. Uh, right down to kind of significantly worsen. So uh, I think we thought, you know, it's a good opportunity for us. We make, uh, we have certain experiences uh, and assumptions that we make, and it, with you all uh, with us today, it's a good opportunity to kind of check that we're, uh, our thinking is along um, the right sort of line. So hopefully we should have um, some answers soon. Yeah. So I, that's not too surprising that. Um, yeah, pretty like uh, so. Eighty-five percent, I uh, think, that's got worse. Um, so yeah, they're good. Well, that, I suppose that means we're uh, along the right lines. There, possibly, I've been leading you towards that direction. And so, uh, not not entirely scientific, I don't think. Um, but okay, well, thank you for that. So we're going to move on to questions. So I think Rosie, you've got. Yes. Um, so also keep sending your questions in now because we've got probably uh, yeah enough space for a few. But I'll get going. So. Um, there's a couple of questions on uh, ministerial uh, reshuffles over the last couple of years. So, so firstly, um, how much effort would you suggest charities put into building relationships with ministers? And is this time better spent working with officials? Um, and then um, how uh, best can you keep track of new ministerial appointments? And are there any tools available that can provide such information without the need to research manually? Yeah, okay, so uh, the first question, uh, how much of it, I mean, I do still think, um, I think sometimes with the, the level of churn we've had in recent years, it can feel like a slightly thankless task to kind of keep <laughs> trying to like build relationships with new ministers. Um, I think it is, uh, I think it's definitely still worthwhile and um, you, uh, you know, there's only so much you can do with officials. Um, ultimately, kind of political direction does come from ministers. So um, it's definitely it's definitely hard when you're having new ministers regularly come into post. I don't think there's anyone who kind of does a public affairs job who would say yeah, that yes, they want ministers to change every six months or a year. Um, but uh, I think it is still pretty essential that you kind of build that relationship. That said, of course, you know, I, as, as we said, you know, those relationships with officials are really important. So. Uh, I think you you do want to see them. Um, in terms of resources uh, to keep on top of who's in post, um, so I think all of the ministerial points have now been announced and should be on um, number the, the number ten site. Uh, there's certainly I think all on the departmental. The other thing actually to watch out for is I don't think all of the ministerial responsibilities in every department have been announced. So um, we certainly had to wait a few days before we found out. <laughs> which of the DCMS ministers would have responsibility for civil society. Um, so you'll have to do uh, probably a bit of checking of uh, generally the departmental websites are best for that. Um, but it's also, you know, if there are stories around this, I, I don't think there's, I, I can't off the top of my head, and that, uh, monitoring is useful again in this uh, scenario, if you can afford monitoring. Mm -hmm. um, but I, other than that, I can't think of too many things off the top of my head that are, in terms of other useful tools. Well, during the announcement to the Parley app, it was quite good. Yeah, um, yeah. But it, yeah, once the kind of announcements were over, kind of clearer briefs, kind of minister to minister are, are harder, I think. Yeah. Um, okay, and this one kind of relates. So another question on what do you think makes a, a really good welcome letter to a new minister? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, I think it's the things I said earlier, really. I think having a sort of, I think you want, do you want to start with a kind of positive tone, um, a kind of sense that you're, uh, you're looking to build a relationship and you're looking to work together. Uh, and I think sounding like you're kind of uh, uh, on the same page 
uh, on particular issues is, is kind of really important. And then, as I said, I think having something which which makes it kind of clear what it is you want to be working on and what your priorities are and how they fit with what the government wants to do. Um, I don't think that I don't think there's too much more to do than that, really. Um, other than yeah, 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 just that kind of clarity. I think is probably most important. Cool. Um, uh, so. Another question actually on influencing uh, kind of officials. So how should charities go about building good relationships with permanent secretaries and other senior civil servants? Yeah, it's kind of an interesting one actually, because um, you probably won't talk to permanent secretaries very often. Um, so actually it's almost about kind of who are the right people. So for us, it's actually probably more the senior officials in OCS who are kind of yeah. very regular up-to-date relationships. But I think it's useful, and again, this is why a new government is a bit of an opportunity just to kind of remind people that you're kind of you're there and what it is you want to do. Um, but I suppose with um, people like permanent secretaries, it's kind of um, it's it's less frequent contact, but it's kind of meaningful. Yeah. Is I think what you're probably looking for. Um, yeah, and then we've got a couple of questions uh, on your on on kind of um, basically general election stuff. So one question saying I wanted to ask your sense of when you think there may be a general election, and do you have a feeling a motion of no confidence is likely in early September, or that it might fall later in the year? Uh, and then sort of. Uh, slightly different question, but on the same theme, do you know when the next parliamentary session is likely to be? I mean, who knows? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're both good questions that I don't really know the answer to. Um, so election, there, there's kind of various theories, uh, one of which is that you kind of, you try to create a situation which um, pits you against um, a parliament and then you can kind of use that as an opportunity mm. um, uh, to go for something. Um, and then the other is you kind of you uh, you wait for Brexit to happen, and then you can kind of go to the country saying you've delivered Brexit. I, I think that might be actually a good point to bring Ben in because I, I I think you'll probably have a better sense of what the Brexit um, elements of that election would be. It's incredibly hard to say. Um, so much depends on timing, as you said yourself. The, the the timing of Brexit is quite awkward in terms of how an accomplice motion would work and and where things would fit about around that. So it's, it's, it's tricky to make any predictions and I generally try to avoid them because I'm so often wrong. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a very, very hard thing to, to say. Um, in terms of Brexit, obviously there's a big, big worry um, that a general election is called during, during kind of the Brexit process. And of course, that, that the elephant in the room there is PERDA, which is where the civil service essentially is shut down. Um, and if, you know, the last two weeks of October, we don't have a civil service which, which is functional um, just before a no deal, no deal Brexit, then we have significant problems um, because the things like Operation Brock, which is the, the operation which is um, taking care of the M20 and, and the Dover um, crossing, um, if those things aren't ready, then we have a real, real problem on, on the 1st of November. Um, so there were a couple of other things about their own um, votes of confidence. So um, I... Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think there are basically two ways. One is you kind of do it in early September, or the second would be just for various reasons, defections, other things, uh, you, uh, the government ends up losing its majority. Which and not it's not that far away. It, it, it's, it's, it's pretty clear. I mean, is it one MP, two MPs? Uh, probably more like three, I think, before you get to that kind of point. And, and there are other questions about how do independence vote in this, in this kind of thing. But, um, I think that's probably less likely than an election being called, certainly once you get beyond the kind of stop and ideal thing. Um, I think in terms of new session of parliament, we probably actually have a slightly better idea because I think it's quite likely that, uh, well, I think, I think we know what the plan is anyway, which is that you leave the EU on the 31st of October and then there would be a new parliamentary session starting shortly after that. I think, yeah. I think that's what I would expect to happen, but of course there are lots of things that could potentially uh, complicate that. Um, yeah, but that, that would be my guess at the moment. But again, uh, like Ben said, no point making that too firm predictions on this kind of thing. I mean, the, the, one, the one thing I would add is that, uh, this is, again, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing to, to, to say anything about this without making predictions, which is often wrong, but it, it does look, one reading of what's happening at the moment, it does look like um, Johnson's administration is setting itself up to be um, 
in a position where it can say both Parliament and the EU are trying to stop us leaving the EU, which will set him quite nicely up for a general election in terms of the rhetoric that the Vote Leave campaign used, and, and presumably with Dominic Cummings that would use again. Um, so it do, does kind of frame a general election around Brexit quite nicely for him. Brilliant. Good. Looking forward to that general election. Uh, so actually, uh, good question on uh, Shared Prosperity Fund. So how can we get more information about the uh, Shared Prosperity Fund? And do you think government has any idea how crucial this will be for charities? Well, I hope it does. There's lots of work going to be able to. Yes, um, <laughs> we've certainly been talking. Ben, you might know a bit more. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so NTVO has held meetings with the Secretary of State for, for exiting the EU um, where we've raised the Shared Prosperity Fund several times because we are ourselves aware and also very acutely aware of the concern within the sector about this. Um, and we have really, really made representation about that quite strongly. Um, it's difficult to know where it is at the moment, in all, in all honesty. Um, the feeling we've got is that the Johnson administration will want to do it quite quickly because, it, as, as, as I made reference to earlier, it's quite a good news story. It's quite a... It's a nice um, kind of both an infrastructure project because they can open it out to include infrastructure projects and, and most likely will. Um, but it's also a positive thing about regenerating communities, um, which is where they'll be looking to spend money. Um, and so we're quite hopeful that, that something will happen. When that will happen, I don't know, because obviously um, it, it, putting primary legislation through Parliament is, is very tricky, as I said. Um, so. It's very, very, it's kind of how long's a piece of string question because obviously we were promised that the consultation would be in October 2017 and, and here we are um, almost two years later with, with no firm date for a consultation. But the feeling we get is it could be soon, but but uh, as I said earlier with, with Brexit on the horizon and civil service time so dominated, probably not until after that. Again, uh, without meaning to sound too negative about everything, um, if we get a no deal Brexit then um, we will end up with a with most likely an emergency no deal budget which could have ramifications for both the design and more importantly the amount of money in a shared prosperity fund yeah and i think also if you do have any really specific policy related questions on a uh, shared prosperity fund do just always get in touch with uh ncvo because uh, ben is working on it a lot um okay is twitter a good platform to engage mps uh, ministers etc uh any views uh, or tips on using social media for influencing MPs? Um, yeah, I think it is. I think it is a good uh, platform. To Obviously, it has its limits, and um, so the one thing that so the thing you can't really do is have kind of um, like really frank conversations. I think it's probably fair to say, um, partly because of uh, yeah, Laura Rams uh, charity campaign, but also because it's not really um, appropriate. Um, <laughs> But I think, yeah, you can use it for your kind of basic engagement and, and some people are better uh, than others. I think it's been really interesting to see, because um, uh, I've been particularly focused on this, there might be better examples. Uh, the new uh, Minister for Civil Society, Baroness Baron, has been actually really active and yeah. it seems to have been quite a good way of, of making. So I, not to say don't do your formal letters, but having a kind of senior person say, yeah, I'm looking forward to kind of working with, uh, with someone. Um, I, I think I'm a bit more um, kind of sceptical about um, using it for the kind of the formal channels and like, do you want to do this? Do you want to kind of come to this? I, I know some people do, and I think maybe for kind of some events, but um, I, I think it can like be a bit awkward and probably not the best place yeah. to do that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I think good for that kind of general relationship building. I guess stuff. it sort of depends as well, A, if the MP is on Twitter yeah. and B, how like that active and engaged they are yeah. because some MPs are using Twitter kind of constantly and some are yeah. not. You have to come up with a good hashtag to engage in next zones. <laughs> um, okay, so that's the last question, uh, but yeah, do feel free to get in touch if you have any more burning questions. I think we went through most of them. Um, so just a couple more things before you all disappear. Um, so NCBO's campaigning conference is happening on the 6th of September. Um, so we've got a couple of uh, keynotes, so we're really excited about morning keynote, we're going to hear from a panel of campaigners who are involved on the kind of ongoing battle uh, for justice for the Windrush generation, so uh, Patrick Burden, who was a local councillor and has been really involved in the campaign, Sabir Singh, who is the chief exec of the Joint Council for the Welfare of Immigrants, Kim McIntosh, who works at uh, uh, Race on the Agenda and Running Me Trust, and also Amelia Gentleman, 
who was the Guardian journalist who broke the Windrush story. Um, and that's going to be chaired by Russell Hargrove, who's a freelance journalist and kind of policy advisor working on immigration policy. And in the afternoon keynote, we have Sue Baker, who is the global director of Time to Change, which is the big um, anti-stigma mental health campaign, which I'm sure you're all very, very aware of. So Sue, I think, literally worked on the campaign since it was kind of a couple of people in a room and it's now it very well recognised as one of the most kind of successful long-term campaigns. It's had such a huge influence on uh, kind of uh, reducing stigma around mental illness in, in the UK and now globally. So she'll be telling us about, I guess, the peaks and troughs of a really long-term kind of sustained campaign effort. Um, and then we've got lots of different workshops. We've got a couple of workshops that will help with kind of more new government stuff. If one on influencing government policy, where we've got some uh, senior civil servants and ex-special advisors, one on manifesto writing, which will involve people from kind of all the kind of key parties. Um, lots of beneficiary focused stuff, so one on uh, lived experience campaigning and one on kind of storytelling case study stuff. Um, the volunteer uh, led campaigning uh, workshop, which we do um, uh, sort of a variation of every year and it's always really, really popular. And then one on uh, local influencing, which I think Ben alluded to earlier, I think will be more important. More and more important to charities at the moment when they're struggling to kind of get heard at a central government level. And then the other thing is our uh, NCBO certificate and campaigning, which is our seven-day kind of intensive uh, training, which kind of starts with starts in October. It goes through. I think you do a day every kind of three weeks. So I finished it last year. It's could not recommend it more, I'm not even biased here. <laughs> You'd literally do everything from kind of theory of change, uh, sort of design work, to all the different kind of approaches and tactics. So there's folks on media, folks on local influencing, folks on digital. Um, so yeah, would absolutely kind of recommend that to everyone. And then any other kind of uh, sort of to have a, a look at any of the other campaigning and influencing training that we are doing, you can just click on the link and yeah. Uh, Make sure you complete the survey. I don't know whether you guys have anything else to say before we say goodbye. Um, no, just to say that if uh, people didn't have, uh, if we didn't answer questions, do feel free. Um, certainly my contact details are there. If it's a bank question, I'm happy to uh, forward it on. Um, yeah, do feel free to kind of uh, follow up over email. Brilliant. Thank you.